Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And um, I, I really do uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you uh, about uh, kids with significant uh, reading problems. I'll tell you in advance that it's almost impossible for me to talk about kids with significant reading problems without talking about uh, dyslexia, uh, which I'm going to define for you in a, in a a probably more liberal kind of way than, than many of you may uh, think. Uh, and the talk will uh, devolve into uh, a dyslexia talk because you basically cannot talk about uh, kids with significant reading problems without talking about uh, dyslexia because even if it's not recognized, uh, most children uh, identified in public schools have problems with foundational reading. Uh, skills and uh, they account for the bulk of kids that that are uh, placed into special education for reading problems, but also the bulk of kids who are struggling readers, and that's across the uh, the grade level spectrum. Uh, and I'm going to give you evidence uh, for that. But I'm also going to build on an article that uh, that Kimberly asked me to uh, talk about which is an article that Sharon Vaughn and I uh, wrote together that was recently published in the American Educator that was really about how to uh, work with children that have intensive uh, re re reading problems. And so I'm gonna start out with some uh, initial observations. Uh, the first is that you hear a lot about the science of reading and how we're not applying the science of reading uh, in schools. Uh, I think that's true. Uh, but I think it's also important to understand that while we know a lot about how children learn to read and why some fail, we know a lot about dyslexia and other kinds of reading problems. We know a lot about just reading development in kids that don't struggle. Uh, not that That's not uniformly translated into uh, the science of reading instruction. Uh, and what we know in the science of reading instruction uh, has more to do with principles. Uh, but it doesn't get down into the nitty gritty of, uh, you know, should I use uh, this approach to teaching phonics or, uh, you know, you know how, do, how do I blend comprehension strategy instruction with phonics instruction? I mean, there's no magic for that. And that's partly because it, it depends very much on the school context and the child you're working with uh, and so on. And so the principles are more important. Uh, than trying to suggest that there's a scientific approach to teaching each individual child. That is not an anti-science uh, perspective. I absolutely believe uh, that we have a very strong science of reading. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's probably uh, more important to recognize that, that when you're teaching foundational reading skills, for example, the principle is to help the child access uh, units of words that are below the whole word, what I would call the sublexical uh, unit uh, in kids that are learning to read or in kids that are struggling. Uh, and that there's cert certainly better, some ways to do that are better than other ways, and we can demonstrate uh, that. But I can't tell you that one approach to teaching uh, kids about sublexical structures of words is better than another approach. Uh, I have some ideas about uh, approaches that will. Uh, enhance outcomes, but to, to say that there's only one way to teach kids with dyslexia really just robs us of access to programs that may be effective for an individual child. So the thing that I think is really important is to really focus a lot on assessing instructional response. And when I talk about uh, reading problems, I talk a lot about uh, instructional response. I focus a lot on kids that I, I I say have an, an inadequate response to quality instruction uh, because I think those are the kids that uh, are really uh, difficult. And then I think we have to focus on building educators' capacity to really deliver more intense, customized, personalized, differentiated uh, interventions. But the single most important issue is to recognize that it's a whole school problem, a whole district problem, a whole country problem. Uh, that the assessments and interventions that we deliver need to, be deli need to be provided through a seamless system that integrates general education and special education because we will not improve reading skills in kids in general and in particular in kids that have severe reading problems uh, if we don't incorporate the time that they spend in general education instruction. 
And that's basically the best rationale that I can give you for an MTSS uh, system because it, 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 it maximizes general education uh, instruction and it doesn't treat special education as an isolated uh, service that's supposed to fix problems that general education can't fix. That model does not work and it's not effective. Uh, so everybody's got a model of a, uh, of a three-tier, multi-tiered multi system of service delivery. Uh, we have a new one that I'm, I'm sort of pleased with because it moves away from the triangles and puts it really uh, in the schoolhouse. Uh, but here you can see the uh, three tiers, you know, and it's divided across instruction that everyone receives, that some children receive based on data that's, uh, that's supplemental uh, instruction, that's tier two, and then uh, tier three where, that a few students uh, re receive who, uh, who need intensive intervention and may or may not be in special education. And I like this uh, because it's more integrated um, and it has kids progressing, you know, within the schoolhouse uh, according to their individual uh, individual needs. Uh, but if you're if you're a person like me who's really interested in disabilities, and you ask me, you know, what's the most important thing that we can do to help kids that have severe reading problems, is to reduce the number of kids that need uh, tier three uh, because. Uh, the interventions that you need to do at tier three are so intense uh, in order to be effective that uh, you really can't afford to provide them to lots of kids. And we have really strong evidence that if we have strong core instruction and strong tier two instruction, the number of kids who need, who need tier three is reduced. And if we could simply reduce it, we could intensify it to levels that would actually make it effective. So, a lot of these issues were addressed uh, in the President's Commission on Special Education, uh, which was published in 2004. That was the last national consensus report uh, on special education, and it wasn't what a lot of people uh, thought. It was the precursor to uh, the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act in uh, 2004. It was like a blueprint for it, but it said three things that I think are very important. Uh, the first is to focus on results, not process. And if you look at what ha has happened with special education accountability, uh, in in uh, the early 2000s, there were there were something like 800 different pieces of process that school districts uh, were expected to attend to. Well, that's changed, and they're now uh, a small set of uh, results-oriented outcomes. You know, like actual achievement scores, uh, time spent uh, in a general education classroom, and so on. That, uh, that special education programs are supposed to be accountable for. Now, if you're in special education, you're going to look at me like I'm crazy uh, because I, I doubt that that's uh, uniform across districts and states. It's certainly not true in my state, uh, but that's, that's, what, uh, that's what the uh, federal government has actually tried to uh, introduce. The second thing that the President's Commission said is to embrace a model of prevention keep kids out of special education unless it's really clear that they need it because special education uh, leads to a model of failure, unfortunately. Uh, the idea is to prevent, reduce, reduce the number who need remediation and intensify remediation. And then the third principle was that children with disabilities are general education children first. And the point was that special education cannot be expected to deal uh, with the range of reading difficulties experienced by students, particularly as an isolated service. If what you do is you do you have a two-tier system, uh, you go to general education, uh, you fail to succeed, uh, you're placed in special education, and there 95% of all children who are placed will stay throughout their uh, school career because it's very difficult to accelerate progress in a remedial program that's an isolated service. Uh, the most important uh, principle uh, for teaching kids uh, that have severe reading problems is laid out in the article that Sharon and I uh, wrote. And, and what we emphasize, you, you won't hear words like systematic uh, coming from us or manualized or something like that. The most important principle is explicit, that instruction is actually implicit and that needs to be true at all tiers. And that is, when we talk about the science of teaching reading, that is one principle that is scientifically 
uh, base, that's not, that explicit instruction that is intentional and teacher directed is more effective than instruction that is incidental or accidental. So you provide explicit instruction that incorporates clear feedback. Uh, and I've laid out some of the things that, uh, that represent explicit instruction, like uh, uh, identifying what teachers do or say prior to teaching, uh, reduce the amount of verbal verbalization that goes towards uh, students, say what they need to know in just a few words, do lots of modeling, ask students to demonstrate what they're taught, uh, provide prompt feedback that is specific and clear, give selected students opportunities to respond independently, control task difficulty, and gradually increase it as performance improves, and maintain high levels of student success engagement in response. Those are the kind of things that we should be focusing on, not pedagogical arguments about uh, curricula. If you want to evaluate curricula, you know, basically, if it's not explicit, uh, it's not going to be uniformly effective, particularly with the 40 to 50 percent of kids uh, who don't find learning to read uh, easily. If you're dealing with students that have mild to moderate difficulties, you want to use academic learning time deliberately and purposefully. You want to always offer customized instruction that reflects student learning needs that begins in Tier 1. You give struggling readers instruction in small groups in Tier 1 and then in Tier 2. Uh, as you go through the tiers, you decrease group size uh, with tier progression. And then you always create opp opportunities to read a wide range of text types and text levels, uh, depending on the child's uh, proficiency. Uh, so now I'm going to transition from these general kinds of principles to talking about kids that have word level reading difficulties, uh, which is basically dyslexia. Uh, because dyslexia itself is a controversial term, I don't, I, I personally have absolutely no difficulty using it. Uh, uh, but I, I treat it synonymously with kids that have difficulty reading words and spelling words in isolation. And there are a lot of those kids, and relatively few of them actually pick up a label of dyslexia. Uh, it is the largest group of students in special education. It's almost two out of five uh, of all children that are identified for special education. Uh, but many children who are not identified for special education have word level difficulties. Uh, there's a myth that uh, dyslexia is not addressed in the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act. Uh, idea when it was originally formulated in 1975 made a, 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 an explicit decision not to include uh, terms that were felt to be overused or medicalized and they included terms like uh, minimal brain dysfunction or developmental aphasia, uh, things that I'm old enough to actually know what was intended uh, by them. Uh, but they didn't use dyslexia for that reason. Instead, they used the term basic reading uh, problems. And you'll see the same sort of terminology reflected in, uh, in uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual from the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, where people talk about kids that have basic reading problems, reading words, not being able to spell. Uh, but uh, the Office of Special Education Programs has been very clear that uh, that dyslexia is a disability. It is Kids with dyslexia are eligible for special education, and you identify it as a basic uh, reading problem. In a lot of states, uh, uh, dyslexia is identified uh, through 504. Uh, programs, but uh, I'm not very positive about that because I think it deprives uh, kids of the civil rights entitlements that they can get through special education. Uh, and if you live in Texas, you know that uh, Texas is under a federal sanction uh, because we have had a dyslexia legislation since 1984, and 75% of kids uh, with dyslexia are being identified through uh, 504, which uh, the Office of Special Education Programs. Uh, felt uh, was a violation of child fine. Uh, they also uh, sanctioned Texas because we were only identifying 8.7% of kids in special education, which is far below the national average. But if you look at the data, that's because 75% of kids with dyslexia were being identified and served through uh, 504. But the key to overcoming dyslexia is to prevent it. I can't emphasize that enough. If you're thinking about implementing an MTSS program and uh, you want to know what the single best thing uh, to do uh, 
uh, to uh, introduce it. Uh, I, I can give you that answer very sim very simply. It's to introduce screening in kindergarten, grade one and grade two, do progress monitoring in grade in, in kindergarten, grade one and grade two, focus your intervention on grade one, uh, because the best data that we have uh, is from grade one uh, uh, two-tier intervention studies, and you will take a huge whack out of those kids that are at risk for reading problems and you will have a huge effect on the number of kids that are actually uh, needing special education. And I'll show you uh, data to that effect. And if you do that, uh, you will probably have the resources to provide intensive remediation to inadequate responders, because those are the kids who are gonna be disabled. And some of those kids will overcome their problem uh, if the intervention is intense enough. So we know that uh, dyslexia occurs primarily at the level of the single word. It involves the ability to decode and spell printed words in isolation, both accurately and automatically. And I emphasize the term automatic because in English, uh, we have lots of kids that are inaccurate decoders. But if you're in a, if you're reading language, if you have an orthography where the relationship between what words look like and what words sound like is more irregular, like German, uh, then, then you, if you have dyslexia, it's basically because you're not automatic and you can't spell. So you're slow at decoding uh, and you can't spell words very well, but you don't usually have a problem with accuracy. Uh, it's really a fluency uh, kind of problem. Dyslexia leads to a problem to problems reading text, but it is not a text level disability. And any explanation of dyslexia, uh, uh, particularly some of the fringe theories that focus on eye movements or things like that that are text level explanations uh, do not apply to dyslexia because kid, these are kids that can't read and spell words in isolation. But like I keep saying, many kids uh, not identified with dyslexia have word level problems. Uh, this, you know, to understand dyslexia, you have to understand the alphabetic principle. Uh, the alphabetic principle is the idea that print represents speech through the alphabet or some other visual symbol. It's not arbitrary. Print is not arbitrary. It's basically a written representation of oral uh, language. Uh, but regardless of the surface appearance, which we call the orthography, words represent internal units based on sound, which are called phonemes. Uh, and so when kids learn to read, their task is to make explicit what is inherently an implicit understanding that words have internal structures that are linked to sounds, and that's called phonological awareness. Uh, for some kids, uh, learning the alphabetic principle is very easy. Uh, they have no difficulty uh, learning the relationship between what words look like and what words uh, sound like. Uh, they're able to access the uh, language areas of the brain that we build the skill upon. And that's why we say that reading is parasitic on language. But language is an evolutionary skill. And we were born with the ability uh, to speak and use oral language. All we have to do is expose the brain to, uh, to language and the brain will organize almost immediately around uh, that kind of language. Reading is not evolutionary. It, we've only had uh, written language for about 4,000 years. Uh, it is an acquired skill. The child has to be taught the relation between what words look like and what words sound like. Uh, and for some kids, it's very easy to teach them that. Uh, I had a daughter, for example, that uh, learned to read at three years of age because it was just intuitive to her. And she picked it up almost uh, immediately. I had another daughter uh, who uh, really struggled to learn to read. It made no sense uh, to her. Uh, she overcame that problem because we put her in a very intense phonics oriented program uh, in kindergarten and uh, first grade. And she now actually writes uh, scripts uh, for a uh, living. But if we hadn't intervened early, I think she would uh, had, have had a reading problem like dyslexia because it is not natural and you can't learn it just through exposure. If exposure or incidental instruction was sufficient, we would not need schools, uh, we would need pickup trucks. And what we would do is we would put kids in the back of the pickup trucks, I know that's illegal, 
uh, but we would ride them up and down freeways and expose them to environmental print, and that would be sufficient. And clearly that's not the case because we have billboard pollution everywhere and a large uh, literacy program in our country. Uh, dyslexia, there a lot of, lot of discussion, particularly in a lot of the state legislation about how to identify dyslexia. Uh, don't make it complicated. Uh, dyslexia is base, best identified through assessments of reading and spelling skills after first grade uh, and assessments of instructional response. But you cannot identify dyslexia independently of attempts to teach the child the skills that they need. And so diagnoses of dyslexia in kindergarten and first grade uh, are really not appropriate. All you can talk about in kindergarten and first grade until you've had a chance to see how the child responds to instruction is risk. And that's why screening for risk is uh, so important. The types of evaluations that people have traditionally done uh, in special education are generally inappropriate anyway. They are especially inappropriate for kids uh, with word level reading disabilities. Uh, you do not need IQ tests. Uh, you do not need extensive uh, batteries or processing skills. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can go to our website and download a manual of best practices for comprehensive assessments and special education that will give you a very abbreviated and truncated comprehensive assessment, but documentation or processing deficits is not required. If you know that a child is struggling to read words and spell words, the first thing is you should do is put them in an intervention program that addresses that and see how they respond. That's the only way that you can figure out if they have dyslexia or not. Uh, if you're screening for dyslexia, I know, that, I know there's a lot of interest in this and a lot of state legislation that uh, addresses it. Uh, you really need to understand that screening is rapid triage that does not burden the teacher. If you ask the teacher to do assessments of every child three, year, three, three times a year and that assessment takes an hour and you have to do it with every kid, uh, you're not, you're not going to be able to sustain the, pro, the, the practice. The goal should be to determine who needs more assessment. Uh, in other words, who needs progress monitoring? Because even if you put in a progress monitoring system and you try to monitor the progress of every uh, child, it's uh, difficult to sustain that. Uh, kind of assessment. So you want to identify those kids uh, who are at risk, uh, give them a reading inventory or assess their progress, but you want to do that in five minutes or less. Uh, the way you do that is you gear the accuracy towards particular types of decisions. You want to minimize false, po you want to minimize false negative errors. In other words, you want your screen to work effectively and not miss kids that are at risk because the consequences of missing a kid who is at risk are much more severe than a false positive area where, where, where you identify a kid is at risk. Notice I'm saying at risk, not has dyslexia. Uh, and then what you do is you do a reading inventory or you monitor their progress to see uh, how they're doing. Uh, and, and that's how you introduce an effective screening program. Uh, there are ways to do this, it's called decision theory but you uh, want to keep your false negative errors below about 10% or so, even if it means that your false positive errors uh, increase. And if you introduce kin kindergarten screening, for example, they will be very high at the beginning of kindergarten. They will go down dramatically by the end of kindergarten, more dramatically by the, by the beginning of first grade and by the end of uh, first grade, uh, both your false positive and your false negative rates uh, will be be well below 20%. Uh, but you cannot separate students with dyslexia from others with foundational uh, reading problems. And I don't believe that we should even be trying uh, to do that. We should not be trying to identify the special disorder called dyslexia. We should be looking for kids that have word level problems. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's all dyslexia. Uh, the brain research certainly supports that. And what we should be focusing on instead is instructional response in an MTSS type of system. Uh, for screening, uh, stay away from uh, extensive screening assessments. I mean, in kindergarten, the uh, best measures are timed and untimed letter names and sounds, uh, phonological awareness. Uh, it's basically letter sound knowledge. You can assess that for accuracy or you can time it. Uh, 
and then do phonological awareness assessments uh, at the beginning of grade one. Uh, the best measures are uh, timed and or untimed word reading measures, you know, just word list and phonological awareness. By the end of grade one uh, uh, and grade and through grade two, uh, what you need are timed and untimed word reading measures. Uh, they can be passages, they can be word lists, uh, but that's what you need to do for screening. If you test positive, you need progress monitoring or a reading inventory. But what we need to do is really embrace the concept of risk and reserve eligibility for comprehensive evaluations. Dyslexia should not be diagnosed independently of efforts to treat it. Uh, if you're going to do progress monitoring in kindergarten, uh, the best measures are time knowledge of letter sounds in grades one to three, uh, timed word, word reading. It could be lists or passages. And grades four through eight, uh, you should be doing uh, time passages, which are maze, mazes where there's a missing word and you fill in the blank. Uh, as you get older, you need less frequent uh, progress monitoring assessments. Uh, and ideally, you would do progress monitoring assessments where the different forms are equated for difficulty. Uh, I know I'm giving you a lot of information uh, without providing the supportive evidence, but Kimberly showed you our book and the supporting evidence is in the uh, book. What's, the, what's most important is, is that these kinds of reading problems, which account for the bulk of kids that have really severe reading difficulties, can often be prevented. Uh, if you don't prevent it and you don't do a good job in uh, kindergarten, grade one and grade two, you will be in a remedial context. And remediation requires much more intensity uh, than what we commonly provide uh, in school, in tier three, for example. But the skills that prevent dyslexia have to be taught early uh, in school, and remediation after grade two is demonstrably less effective. Uh, Carol Connor's done work in the journal education uh, classroom. Maureen Lovett has done work uh, with remedial programs, and what they find is that intervention in grade one and grade two is twice as effective as intervention in grade three. Uh, and our data shows that it's even more difficult if you start introducing intensive interventions in, uh, in, in middle school, uh, for example. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. It's just going to take a long time, and it really needs to be very intensive. So let me demonstrate what I think an intensive re uh, intervention actually represents. Uh, this is from a study that was done 20 years ago by Joe Torgerson. Uh, and what Joe did is he uh, took kids that were in special education who were reading below the fifth percentile in decoding skills. Uh, they were in the third, fourth, and fifth grade. And what he did is he gave them one of two different types of interventions, uh, which I'll, I'll show you in just a minute. But that's what the two lines on this uh, chart represent uh, are the intervention outcomes uh, that, that he provided for the two programs. Now, the intervention was unique because it was only eight weeks, but it was two hours a day. It was a summer boot camp uh, for teaching uh, reading skills uh, to kids. And so they got about 70 hours of, intention of, of, of instruction over about uh, 70 weeks, uh, 70, sorry, eight weeks for 70 hours. Uh, Joe had the uh, data that was used to place the children in special education and that's the first data point that you see that represents pre-pretest. And then he did a pretest 18 months on average later when he, when he actually started his study. And what you see from pre-pretest to, to pretest are flat lines. And those are basically what special education out outcomes look like uh, for kids with significant reading problems uh, over time. You see flat lines. It's not that the kids are not growing. They are growing, but they're not accelerating their growth. And the reason these lines are flat is that these are age-adjusted scores. If they were accelerating, these uh, skills would be, uh, would, would, be, would be positive. And if you looked at the raw curves, the, the actual growth, you would see growth. Uh, but the kids are not changing their rank in the population. There's no acceleration. So then you see the results of the, uh, the eight-week uh, program where uh, kids uh, approximated the uh, average level. That would be the 25th percentile standard score of uh, 90 right here. 
And what's really important is that 70% of the kids were able to read in the average range after the eight week intervention and 40% of them left special education altogether. Uh, you can also see that outcomes are very similar for the two programs uh, and that they persisted for two years. So this was not a transitory uh, intervention. Uh, and, and Joe's intervention was only two years, it was only eight weeks. Uh, the kids were uh, left to the school's devices uh, after that, but they continued to make progress. Now, the, the, it's important to note what the interventions look like because we get into these pedagogical uh, arguments. Uh, one, one program was the Linda Mood Bell uh, program, which is, which is a multi-century program that teaches kids uh, that uh, uh, words uh, are made of uh, sounds and actually teaches them how to make the sounds. Uh, so it's got an articulatory kind of components that teach kids about lippers and poppers and things like that. That program is highly scripted, manualized. Kids spend 85% of their time doing work in phon phonemic awareness and phonemic decoding, 10% with sight words, and 5% reading or writing connected text. Joe compared that to a program that he called embedded phonics, which is organized, but it's not manualized. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it, it would meet broad definitions of systematic, but not systematic uh, in the sense that a lot of people would uh, use it. Uh, it spent 20% uh, of time in uh, phonemic awareness and phonemic decoding, which in a two hour block is a lot of time, 30% uh, in sight word instruction and 50% reading or writing connected text. Uh, no difference in outcomes. Uh, so I showed you good gains, uh, and here I've broken the gains out for word reading accuracy, where you can see good growth, for comprehension, uh, where you also see growth. Don't ever let uh, anybody tell you that being able to read the words doesn't lead to better comprehension, uh, but notice uh, what the problem is. The kids are not automatic. Uh, they're still very slow uh, decoders. Uh, and the slowness is a problem that actually kept a lot of these kids from being independent and from getting out of special education. Because it, Torgerson found that uh, while the kids could read uh, text that was at their instructional level, they were extremely slow in reading grade level uh, text because they were not uh, automatic. And so we can teach kids to be deco to decode and we can teach them to be accurate in a remedial context. But the automaticity issue is a real problem uh, for older uh, kids. Uh, so decoding is usually teachable at any age with sufficient intensity, but reading rate is limited because the number of words uh, in grade level passages that the kid can read on site uh, is limited. They, they just don't have the sight word vocabulary. And the issue is how do you close the gap when the student is already three to five years behind, you know, this is, this is Torgerson's study. They're in third, fourth, and fifth grade. And basically the way to understand these kids is that their decoding skills are so poor that print has no meaning uh, to them. It's not a, it's not a comprehension problem. It's that they can't make sense out of the words. They have, you know, what, what people used to call word blindness. Uh, and it's actually not a matter of age. It's a matter of exposure and experience. If you don't have access to print, uh, the, the brain does not have the opportunity to organize around print and become a rapid orthographic analyzer. That's the key to proficient reading. Now, I'm going to show you what this means uh, in a little bit, but I'm going to make a case for early intervention uh, first and show you that uh, early intervention prevents a lot of these problems. Uh, Across the board, 70 to 90% uh, of kids in prevention studies defined as the bottom 20% uh, can learn to read in the average range. And when they do that, it prevents the automaticity problems. Uh, this is a graph that shows you this. Uh, the blue line is decoding. The red line is fluency, automaticity. Uh, this is Torgerson's first study here, where you see a huge discrepancy between uh, accuracy and automaticity. This is a this is another study that he did 
uh, where he got even better results, but you still see that discrepancy in older children. These are the results of two prevention studies done by Torgerson and, and Frank Bellatino, another uh, researcher. And you, they're early intervention studies in kindergarten and grade one, and you can see that there's no discrepancy between uh, uh, accuracy and fluency. Uh, to do this, uh, I mean, those were just prevention studies. They didn't really deal with general education instruction, but we now know that if we uh, work both at Tier 1 and at Tier 2, our outcomes are even better. And that brings in the role of MTSS. Uh, dyslexia, if you want to do something about it, has to be treated in the context of MTSS. We have to focus on instruction, amplify the role of general education instruction, uh, isolating students with dyslexia as a disorder that must be remediated, which is how we've always thought about it, is just a recipe for persistence. The problem will just persist. And in particular, restricting eligible interventions to those that meet traditional definitions of multi-sensory is not supported. And by multi-sensory, I mean the parts that have uh, kids uh, uh, using their hands. You know, they talk about teaching to all the sensory uh, modalities. Uh, that part is not effective. Uh, what multi-sensory should mean is multimodality. Uh, you see a word, you say a word, you write a word. That is a characteristic of a lot of good programs that address learning to read at a sublexical level, like, for example, uh, direct instruction, which is effective uh, with kids that have word level uh, problems. So effective intervention uh, include strong core reading programs that teach decoding, fluency practices, and comprehension based on the National Reading Panel principles. Tier 2 builds on Tier 1. It does look like Tier 1, except it's in small groups. And Tier 3 may isolate an area that's not developing. Like if the kid is not learning to decode, then you group kids according to their level of decoding, and you do something like uh, what Torgerson uh, did. But if you have a core program, and it doesn't have an explicit phonics component, or uh, it doesn't have, all it teaches is phonics. Uh, you know, you'll end up with kids that are word callers but can't comprehend. If you don't have them practicing, you'll have kids with fluency difficulties. If you don't teach phonics explicitly, uh, you will have kids with dyslexia. Uh, there is no specificity of appropriate interventions uh, at, e at any tier. What research supports are programs that are explicit, that are comprehensive, meaning that they teach multiple competencies, decoding, fluency, and comprehension. Kids with dyslexia do better if you give them comprehensive programs that include decoding, opportunities to practice, and teach comprehension based on what they're learning about decoding than if you just teach them phonics. There's no question about it. And then the programs need to be differentiated according to the kids' individual needs. And the way you do that, particularly for decoding, uh, is you group kids according to their levels of reading proficiency. Uh, and you do that in Tier 1 and in Tier 2 and in Tier 3. Uh, those are the three things that are most important and what you should be evaluating when you're looking at programs. What research does not support are programs that are defined as is multi-sensory and an exclusive relationship with uh, dyslexia. The efficacy data for so-called multi-sensory or Orton-Gillian programs is reasonable, but they have not been studied adequately and the effect size uh, data, the, the, the effectiveness of the programs, does not show that they're more effective uh, for kids with dyslexia than other phonics-based programs. Sharon Vaughn has a recent paper on that. I would encourage everybody uh, to look at it uh, if you're really being uh, uh, indoctrinated with the idea that multi-sensory programs are essential. It does not, approach, it does not support balanced literacy uh, programs. What those programs do is breed dyslexia. Uh, although manualized programs are entirely appropriate, they're not necessary. Uh, if teachers are concerned about deprofessionalization, de but they have to be manualized. Research does not support uh, multiple cueing systems. Kids should be taught to sound out words and not use context, particularly if they're poor readers. It does not support uh, approaches that, are, that you might consider to be discovery or constructionist 
exposure types of programs. Those programs breed kids with dyslexia. And it also doesn't support programs that are so heavily rule-based that the child does not get adequate print exposure. You have to expose kids to print and have them reading at their instructional level in order for them to uh, really uh, organize the brain to be a reading brain. So, so to summarize, what you do is you teach phonics explicitly as part of a comprehensive program that addresses multiple competencies, decoding, fluency, and comprehension. And I mean at any level, tier one, tier two, and maybe even tier three, although in tier three, you may isolate a skill. You teach spelling in larger graphemic or morphological units because that promotes automaticity. Automaticity is a matter of being able to process increasingly large internal structures of words until you move to the ability to identify the word immediately based on the statistical regularities by which uh, word and letter, letter combinations occur. That's what the brain does. You prevent word recognition problems because remediation is difficult and requires considerable intensity, particularly for automaticity. But older students and adults can be taught word recognition if the approach is sufficiently intense. Uh, and that doesn't mean 30 minutes a day for the rest of your life. Unfortunately, it's something like what Torgerson uh, did. Now, I'm going to demonstrate this with an example from a study that we published uh, many years ago. Uh, that had both an early intervention uh, component and a brain imaging uh, component. And this was a first grade tier one, tier two uh, study where we uh, screened everybody uh, in six uh, elementary schools uh, in an in a economically and culturally diverse urban school district, uh, identified uh, kids that were at risk, uh, gave them uh, one of two different early interventions, but where everybody got 90 minutes of quality cl classroom instruction and language arts uh, instruction. There, uh, we didn't provide this, but the school district did. There were new curriculums. There were basils that had explicit uh, components, uh, and there was an extensive professional development component. And then what we added for some of the kids uh, was a tier two intervention that was 40 minutes per day in groups of three uh, or so. Uh, our, our tier two teachers basically worked with 18 students uh, per day, which uh, based on a classroom average at the time of 22 students per classroom was the equivalent of adding a first grade teacher to uh, each of these uh, schools. Uh, the two interventions that were done just for tier two, so everybody's getting tier one, and then some kids are getting an additional tier two intervention. Uh, one was a very explicit scripted manualized uh, direct instruction program that provided explicit instruction in synthetic phonics, but with an emphasis on fluency, say it fast. Uh, but it integrated decoding fluency and comprehension strategies. And we actually had authentic stories written by hired uh, authors who uh, use the phonics principles that we were teaching. Uh, but we also uh, added comprehension lessons uh, to them. Uh, it had 100% decodable text with isolated practice, uh, and it was very prescriptive uh, with a manual, a carefully constructed scope and sequence, uh, and so on. We compared that to a program that we called responsive intervention uh, that was an organized curriculum, but where teachers were expected to use their judgment. Uh, Ten minutes of every lesson involved uh, explicit instruction in synthetic phonics using blending and analogy phonics using word families. But it taught decoding using the alphabetic principle, fluency and comprehension, but strictly in the context of reading and writing. It was organized, but there was no scope and sequence. Teachers were expected to respond to the student needs as they were observed, and it used level text, not phonemically decodable uh, text, all in small groups. Uh, so this just gives you an idea of what a lesson would look like. Uh, you would do fluency work, repeated reading and assessment for eight to 10 minutes. There would be 10 to 12 minutes of word work, sounding out words, uh, and then supported reading and supported writing uh, for the rest of the uh, lesson. We thought that one program would be better than another program with certain types of kids. It turns out that the two programs uh, were comparably effective. This is fluency data. Uh, across the year from the progress monitoring assessments, October through uh, April. 
And the two lines in the middle, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, represent the two tier two uh, interventions. And then what we call the control are kids that were, that were at risk who only got tier one instruction. And then we had a group of typical, typical tier uh, kids who are not at risk. What you see is, sorry, no difference in uh, the two uh, types of intervention. So the, the different principles didn't make a matter, make a difference. What was important is that they were explicit, comprehensive, and they were actually differentiated because we grouped according to learning needs. But notice how well the tier one instruction worked in itself. Uh, because if you look, all three at-risk groups are closing the gap relative to the typical uh, achievers. It's just that tier two, tier, you know, more time in instruction worked better than just uh, tier one. But this is the most telling thing. If all you got was enhanced classroom instruction, tier one, there were 92 kids in that condition. Uh, there were 15 of them that did not meet uh, bench level uh, benchmarks at the end of first grade. That is 16% of that group. Uh, if you, when when you recognize that the group represents the bottom 20% and you multiply 0.16 times 0.2, that means that there were 3.2% of the school population across these six schools that were not reading at grade level at the end of first grade. Uh, if you looked at the effects of both tier one and tier two, there were seven kids across both interventions that were not at grade level. Uh, that's 4% of those groups. That is less than 1% of the school population, uh, a handful of kids. So what we did with those kids is we gave them a tier three intervention in second grade, because this is a very controlled program. We were not uh, moving kids in and out across the tiers and so on. And we gave them uh, a Torgerson-like program for eight weeks using uh, a program called Phonographics, which teaches kids that, uh, that, uh, that that words are, are pictures and teaches 144 uh, phonograms, but teaches at the sublexical uh, level. And then because we knew about the automaticity program, we gave them eight weeks of read naturally for an hour a day. So phonographics was two hours a day, read naturally was one hour a day. The teachers were the same teachers that uh, delivered proactive and responsive uh, instruction. And this is just a summary of the uh, outcomes. These kids, who did not meet, there are 27 of them, they did not meet benchmarks at the uh, end of the year. Some of them were very severe. They made an average gain of two thirds of a standard deviation. That is not a flat line, that is an accelerated line. Uh, but it varied considerably across individual kids. So if you look over here on uh, my right, uh, you can see that, that there's a group of kids that took off like gangbusters. There's a group of kids that are in the middle these kids need more intervention than we uh, provided. And there are some kids where the program did not work at all. And what we should have done is change programs and tried a different type, different approach to teaching sublexical uh, instruction. But the reality is, is that no matter what you do, there will be some kids who simply contend, continue to struggle. But our tier three intervention took another third, uh, uh, reduced the number of kids that were, that were behind by half. Again, so we have very few kids at the end of second grade who are not at grade level. Uh, I can't emphasize enough. I, I hope this shows up because uh, I, I struggled to create this uh, slide. I can't emphasize enough the need to think about more complex approaches to teaching uh, the alphabetic pr principle that includes uh, more than just word work, a lot of practice, some focus on comprehension. And this is from a study that was done by Robin Morris, Maureen Lovett, and Mary Ann Wolf that used uh, programs called uh, FAST, the, the abbreviation is up there, uh, and RAVO, which is Mar Maureen, uh, sorry, Mary Ann uh, Wolf's uh, program, uh, and then compared it to a simple phonics program. And if you look here where it says G, these are the effect sizes when you compare uh, just fast, RAVO is similar, but you compare these much more complex programs uh, to teaching sublexical principles just to a simple phonics program. Uh, these effect sizes are, are really significant. 
uh, and much larger than uh, what you see if you just did a phonics program alone. Uh, these, these are about uh, a half to two-thirds of a standard deviation and are clearly accelerated. And these are third and fourth graders who are reading below the 15th percentile in uh, multiple uh, urban uh, schools. So more complexity and more richness uh, in the program is more effective than simply teaching graphing, phoneme, uh, correspondence rules in isolation. Uh, but even that, even the group that we call FAB, they got FAB plus classroom survival skills, had, had small effect sizes and did better than kids that got no instruction at all. In other words, got the instruction that the school provided. Some people say that this type of instruction doesn't persist. Uh, this is from a 10-year follow-up that Benita Blockman did of a 10-year of a tutorial program of kids in uh, second grade where she uh, gave them one-on-one -on -one intervention for, for a school year. Uh, this is uh, the, black, the, the black line are kids that got the intervention. The white line are kids that did not get the intervention but got what the school provided. Uh, the, first, the first set is the pretest, and you see no differences. The second set uh, are kids at the end of the intervention where kids who got the intervention are doing much better than kids that did not get the intervention. Uh, these gains persisted for a year after the intervention, which is a third graph. And then Benita went out and found these kids 10 years later. Most of them uh, uh, were graduating or had graduated from, uh, from uh, high school. And you can see that the gains uh, persisted uh, across 10 years. You still see that, uh, that the kids that got the intervention are doing better than kids that didn't get the intervention. But there's also a whole host of other outcomes, like who graduated, uh, vocational success, who went to college, and things like that, that were much better in the group that got early intervention than the group that, uh, that didn't. So it persists. Uh, you do not get the same results uh, if you introduce a multi-tiered intervention program in middle school. And I'm not being negative about this. I'm trying to highlight the importance of really focusing on the early grades. Uh, we did an adolescent study, Sharon Vaughn and I, uh, where the MTSS principles were the same. Uh, we put uh, screening and progress monitoring uh, in place, but the progress monitoring was less frequent because kids' uh, levels of growth are much slower. We progress monitored uh, every quarter, not every uh, two to three weeks. We introduced team-based team uh, decision-making with literacy as a, as a central focus. For tier one, we focused on comprehension and vocabulary instruction in content areas and worked with English teachers and social studies teachers and science teachers on how to use content to teach uh, vocabulary and background knowledge. And then we, for kids that were struggling, which we defined as kids who didn't pass the state accountability test, uh, we gave them alternatives. They got, they got an extra reading class, basically, uh, and we manipulated uh, group size depending on the type and severity of the reading problems. Uh, I want to show you what these kids uh, look like. We had uh, a thousand uh, struggling readers who did not pass the uh, state reading comprehension test. Seventy uh, of, of these kids, 81% uh, had problems in decoding and fluency. That's four out of five, and only one-fifth had a comprehension problem. So these early decoding problems persist and there are a lot of other studies that show very similar kinds of findings. Poor reading in middle school and high school, unfortunately, often starts uh, with uh, a foundational reading problem. Uh, this is just one approach to showing you the outcomes of this study, um, where we, get, we ended up giving the kids uh, three years of intervention, because at the end of the first year, we had no evidence that the intervention was more effective than what the schools were uh, doing. And you see that here in the year one data. Uh, so we gave the kids, uh, we took the kids out who didn't respond to the intervention continued with the, and continued with them. After two years of intervention, we had uh, significant differences, but it took two years. Uh, and by three years, uh, we had huge effects. This is an age-adjusted reading comprehension uh, tests. Uh, and you can see that there's acceleration in the treatment group here, but a lot of these kids, even though almost every child passed the state accountability test, a lot of these kids are not terribly proficient 
uh, at reading. But look what's happening to the comparison group here. These are kids that fail the state test, would be considered struggling readers. They're, they're mostly reading below the 20th percentile in their decoding skills. And you see that they're not maintaining their population rank. This is not a uh, loss of skill or anything of that sort. It's simply that they're not keeping up at all and they're not getting any kind of intervention. Uh, so why is early intervention more effective than, uh, than uh, later remediation? Why can't we just take people at any point and teach them? Well, that has to do with how the brain works. And there are two metaphors that are really effective. Uh, the first is that uh, reading is parasitic on speech. Uh, and what that represents is a, a brain system that, that uses sublexical components of words uh, and is, is called a dorsal system. I'll show you what that means uh, in a minute. It's basically the language areas of the brain. But then there's a second system, uh, which has to do with uh, rapid graphemic uh, processing. And the metaphors that people use are reading is unlocking language from vision and language at the speed of sight. What we know is that there's malleability. These structures change, they reorganize when you learn to read, and there's malleability in development and in instructional response, but access and experience is the key for automaticity. Uh, it's called dual route theory where we have two reading words has two routes. One is sublexical, where you have to access the phonological representation and identify the substituent parts. That is how kids learn to read. No one learns to read without accessing this system and attaching it to uh, print uh, because it deals with the relationship of sound and print. It's just easier for some kids than heart than others. And then we have this ventral system, which is a lexical system that goes directly from the word form to its pronunciation and meaning. They operate in parallel. They're not separate systems. They operate in parallel and they're differentially activated depending on the properties of the word and your familiarity uh, with it. Uh, and this is what it looks like in the brain. Uh, the dorsal, if you're reading a word, uh, your, your visual cortex, which is here in the back of the brain, I hope you can see my cursor, but behind the purple area, uh, all visual information goes there. It then goes uh, here to this occipital temporal cortex uh, and the fusiform gyrus for, for processing. If it's a word and, and you don't know much about the word, it then goes up to the up the dorsal route for processing, which is sublexical, and the word is broken down according to how it sounds. But as you develop experience and familiarity and you're exposed to print and you learn the alphabetic principle, you program this ventral route here for immediate access to the meaning of the word, which would be here, or the pronunciation of the word, which would be in this yellow area uh, here. And this is basically a uh, model of how reading works in the brain. Uh, this ventral area has something called the visual word form area. It's called the fusiform uh, gyrus that becomes highly specialized for reading words. Uh, uh, you, can, you can actually do imaging and show that it changes in normal kids that are learning to read, but you can take adult illiterates. And when adult illiterates are initially exposed to words, that representation is bilateral in both the left and the right hemispheres. But as they are exposed and taught about the relation of sound and print, it almost immediately begins to organize and turns into a rapid graphemic uh, processor. But it takes experience and exposure to get this to uh, organize. And if you have a problem uh, in this area of the brain that keeps you from relating sound and print, uh, then this area, the, the ventral route, is not going to organize. So if you go through and you're at risk for dyslexia or you don't get adequate reading instruction or something like that, the dorsal area will not adequately organize. And if it doesn't adequately organize, uh, you won't develop automaticity because the ventral route won't organize. And if you go to several years in school without opportunity, uh, then uh, you simply won't have, uh, it, it becomes very difficult to program that area of the brain because you can't get the exposure that you need. You just can't read enough to do it.
So you can see these same patterns in uh, real brains. These are brain imaging uh, patterns uh, from a third graders who are, the, the one at the top is a typical reader. And if you look in the left hemisphere, uh, the yellow is the ventral system, the uh, orange uh, is the dorsal uh, system, and you see a nice pattern of activation when the child is reading a word that's lateralized to the left hemisphere and not the right hemisphere. The child below has uh, dyslexia. You can see that there's no neural network in the left hemisphere because the child has not learned that words are linguistic uh, symbols. Instead, you get activation uh, of these uh, same areas in the right hemisphere. Uh, uh, which is a response to novelty or com a compensatory type of response, uh, but it doesn't work uh, because the child can't uh, read. When you expose a child with dyslexia to instruction and the instruction is effective, uh, this is basically from a study where we took Torgerson's methods with kids that were very severe decoding, added a brain imaging uh, component. If the child responded to instruction, you can see uh, before pictures where there's no development of the left hemisphere network, and then after pictures where you get significant activation of this dorsal uh, network here. You can see it in both these cases, but this was true on a case-by-case -case basis in kids who responded, and there are over 20 studies now that show this. This is the uh, first grade intervention study, post-test uh, imaging study. Uh, the left hemisphere is on my left, and you can see that there's a nice development here. Here's the dorsal system uh, in the middle of this brain. Uh, this is a kid who responded to the intervention, and you can see development of the uh, network uh, in the left hemisphere. Uh, kids don't lose skills because the, the brain becomes uh, uh, reorganized in adults. Uh, their visual and object processing actually improves. Uh, and then uh, this is a child who is a non an inadequate responder, and you can see no development of the neural uh, network. Uh, so we can actually differentiate kids based on uh, instructional response, and that's why instructional response is a very fundamental concept uh, if you're thinking about disability. So there are four things that we need to know. We don't know everything. If I was focusing on the science of reading instruction, I would want to know more about how to harmonize interventions across tiers. Uh, I think core, core and tier two interventions are often not aligned, uh, but I'm not sure of the best ways to align them. I'm pretty sure that if we do align them uh, and we emphasize the core principles in tier two, that it's better than not aligning. And, and Barbara Foreman's done studies that show that. We really struggle to figure out what to do because uh, students who struggle are a very diverse, heterogeneous uh, group. We know that the benefits of differentiation are apparent at all tiers, but we need to work a lot on how to help teachers uh, personalize. Uh, and Carol Connor has done great work uh, in that area. Uh, we need to know a lot more about how to do large group instruction versus small group uh, instruction in tier one. And then the biggest problem is automaticity, how to close the practice gap and what to do about automaticity in kids who continue to struggle. Uh, if you ask me who is dyslexic, you're not going to hear something about IQ tests or IQ or anything of that sort. You're not going to hear me define a group of kids that's very exclusive. Uh, to me, it's simply the child who does not respond to quality instruction. Uh, who has uh, word level problems. They are hard to teach, not, a, not unable to learn. Uh, it's both low achievement and inadequate instructional response. It's often preventable with early intervention. Uh, there's no question but that risk characteristics are heritable, uh, but the neural systems are malleable. I cannot emphasize that enough. They are malleable in development and in relation to instruction. Uh, so I'll leave you with this thought from uh, the guy that discovered the alphabetic principle, Alvin Lieberman. Uh, he said that we are all born with dyslexia. In other words, we are not born with a reading brain. But the difference among us is that some are easy to cure and others are not. And what's the cure? It's instruction. Uh, this is my email address, and I absolutely respond to emails with questions or requests for more materials. But you can find... Um, uh, a lot of this material uh, on our website. Uh, I appreciate Kimberly referring you to our book because everything that I've talked about is in the book 
and uh, I always have to acknowledge our research uh, support, which is from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. So I'll stop there, and I think there's time for a few questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fletcher. I've been jotting down people's questions. And so um, when you were talking about dyslexia and word reading difficulties, a question was asked by Michelle, what about English language learners? Well, we I, most of our research now, our dyslexia research is focused on English learners. And the principles that I'm talking about are universal. Uh, uh, particularly as far as instruction is done. Sharon Vaughn, Sharon Vaughn has done uh, uh, intervention study. She's actually used the uh, proactive intervention and adapted it to Spanish and used it with, with struggling English learners with the same types of results. People focus on whether it should be done in English or in Spanish. That's not the big issue. The big issue is, is the program explicit, comprehensive, and differentiated? Uh, the big difference if you talk about struggling readers in Spanish is that because Spanish has a more transparent orthography, the relation of what words look like and what, what they sound like, the problem occurs more at the uh, syllable level than at the phoneme uh, level. And a lot of these kids can learn phonemes uh, pretty readily. Uh, the other big issue with, uh, with English learners is poverty. Um, because uh, many are economically disadvantaged, and so you're dealing with sort of a du double whammy of minority language and the effects of poverty on language uh, development. But the principles are the same. Excellent, thank you. And I did for everyone, if you were to scroll up in the chat, I did add the link to the Meadows Prevention Center so you could see the resource library where you could see some of the um, documents I believe that you were referring to, Dr. Fletcher. Second question that came up was teaching strategies at the secondary level. What do you recommend for high schools? Well, I, I, I don't have a age-based recommendation. I think you take the child at their uh, instructional level and teach them, um, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're talking about decoding skills, you teach them at their instructional level. And so, uh, you know, I, at one point I didn't give out programs because I'd just get in trouble, but I don't really care anymore. Uh, the language program is, is very good with, uh, with older kids. Um, I am an advocate of direct instruction programs uh, all through uh, school. They are effective. They have, you know, they, they, are, they're, they are easy to learn to uh, give. Uh, I think you do need an organized uh, uh, program. Uh, and those are some examples of those, but it needs to be personalized, you know, for the child's reading level. And it has to have the child reading material, even if it's mechanic, mechanics magazines. There are a lot of programs that teach at the sublexical level that can be used. Thank you. How about the role of teacher knowledge in understanding structured language and literacy, how to effectively teach reading and intervene? Well, uh, I, I'm, I know you heard Louisa Motes, and you know I abs I'm an absolute supporter of structured literacy. Uh, programs, uh, but I, I, I think that to a certain extent that's a metacognitive uh, uh, issue. I mean, I think the more the teacher, the teacher knows, the better. The more they understand about the structure of language, the better. I'm not sure that they need to know every single uh, rule about morphemes and phonemes and grammar and syntax. Uh, I, I think just like with children, this is a threshold skill. I don't think children need to know every single uh, uh, phoneme graphene correspondence because I think it's a, a metacognitive understanding, an overarching uh, understanding that kids have to develop. Uh, some kids can only learn if you teach everyone and you make it very explicit, but it's a threshold. Thank you. I know that some folks are putting in the chat about the issue of time at the secondary level. I will tell you that um, uh, Dr. Sharon Vaughn is currently paneling an IES practice guide. Um, I am also on the panel with her. It's adolescent literacy. At, it's uh, an intervention practice guide that myself, along with several others, Russ Gersten's group, uh, Deborah Reed are a part of. So we are going to be um, starting to try to tackle and provide some recommendations around intervention for adolescent students. What is, what is that? I mean, you know, the, the Torgerson program, you know, the eight-week eight programs I know are very difficult to implement. 
uh, I can never get anybody to fund me to compare eight weeks with 16 weeks, for example. But I know those are effective. But what we actually do are the two-year intervention programs where we basically take over a reading class, give the kids an extra reading class in middle school and in high school, but it takes at least two years to get gains. We just we haven't published this yet, but we just did that with, uh, with a group of English learners uh, who, who can't read. And um, again, it took two years to uh, show significant gains. Thank you. Um, uh, question about the research, one final question. The research you were sharing, was that done predominantly with public schools, private schools, charters? Public schools. We only work in public schools and we work in, uh, in schools that have high numbers of economically disadvantaged uh, kids. So in, in our, 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 you know, the district that I work in predominantly is 81% uh, free and reduced lunch. It is 90% uh, members of, of, of minority groups. Uh, and the schools themselves are uh, all Title I. The schools that we work with are almost always Title I eligible uh, schools. About 20 to 25% of the, of the students that we work with uh, are actually identified for special education. Thank you. Well, we have many wonderful, positive chat uh, comments in the chat box. We thank you so much, Dr. Fletcher, for your time and for joining us at our annual conference. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. And don't hesitate to email me if you have questions. Will do. Bye, everyone. For those of you who are getting sketches, here's your ending code. So make sure you jot that down. Have a great day, everyone.